In 1902, archaeologists led by British explorer John Garstang stood amidst the sands of Nuerat, a village located 265 kilometers south of Cairo, near the ancient necropolis of Beni Hassan. Among their finds was a sealed clay pot. Inside, curled in a fetal position, lay the skeleton of a man who lived 4,500 to 4,800 years ago. This was not the gilded sarcophagus of a pharaoh or the tomb of a noble. This was the resting place of a commoner. But this unassuming burial has revealed the oldest complete genome ever sequenced from an ancient Egyptian. The results of the study revealed unexpected ancestry, labor, and cultural connections, as well as the origins of one of history's greatest civilizations. The individual lived between 2855 and 2570 BC. This was a time of transformation. By the time our man lived, the Great Pyramid of Khufu, completed around 2580 BC, was either rising or newly finished. But who were the people behind this civilization? Were they solely indigenous North Africans, or did their blood carry traces of far-off lands? For decades, attempts to read ancient Egyptian DNA were thwarted. From the 1980s, geneticists tried to extract genetic material from mummies, but failed. The chemicals used in mummification, natron salts and resins, preserved flesh for the afterlife, but destroyed the delicate DNA within. Later studies partially sequenced DNA from 90 mummies dating from 1380 BC to 425 BC, but their DNA only yielded partial results, not the full story. The New Erat man changed everything. His DNA was well preserved due to a combination of luck and burial practices. Unlike mummies, he wasn't embalmed as mummification wasn't common yet. His body was sealed in a pottery vessel and placed in a rock-cut tomb in New Erat, protecting it from the harsh climate. The dry climate usually degrades DNA, but the pot and tomb acted as a shield. Radiocarbon dating confirmed he died between 2855 and 2570 BC, during Egypt's early Old Kingdom, around the time of pyramid building. The researchers from Liverpool John Moores University and the University of Aberdeen extracted the DNA from the cementum of his tooth, a hard, bone-like tissue that anchors teeth to the jaw, ideal for preserving genetic material. His genome has been sequenced at 2.02x coverage, meaning scientists read his DNA twice over to ensure accuracy. So, who was this commoner? The researchers compared his genome to over 3,000 modern and 800 ancient individuals, using tools like Principal Component Analysis, PCA, a method that plots genetic similarities on a graph, like a map of ancestry, and admixture clustering, which breaks down ancestry into colorful bars, like a pie chart of heritage. The results were astonishing. About 77.6% of his ancestry came from Middle Neolithic North Africans, like those at Morocco's Skirat Rouazi site, likely the indigenous people of the Nile Valley who farmed wheat and barley along the river's fertile banks. These were the descendants of early farmers who tamed the Nile's floods, building the foundations of Egyptian civilization. But 22.4% of his DNA traced to Neolithic Mesopotamia from 9,000 to 8,000 BC in the Eastern Fertile Crescent, modern-day Iraq, Iran, and parts of Syria and Jordan. A tiny fraction, 1.1 to 4.7 percent, hinted at Levantine ancestry from the eastern Mediterranean, including modern-day Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. The Fertile Crescent, often called the Cradle of Civilization, was where humans first domesticated plants and animals around 10,000 BC, sparking the Neolithic Revolution that transformed societies from hunter-gatherers to farmers and city dwellers. Scientists also looked at his maternal and paternal lineages, mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA, passed down from mothers, and the Y chromosome, passed down from fathers. Each belongs to a haplogroup, a genetic branch that traces deep ancestry to ancient populations. His mitochondrial DNA, inherited from his mother, belonged to haplogroup N1A1B2, common in North Africa and West Asia, while his Y chromosome from his father was E1B1B, widespread in the region. The absence of long runs of homozygosity, stretches of identical DNA, suggested his parents weren't closely related, pointing to a diverse community. At first glance, this might seem puzzling. Both his maternal and paternal haplogroups point to North African origins, so how can his genome show Mesopotamian ancestry? The reason is that haplogroups trace only two direct family lines, mother's mother's mother and father's father's father. Most of our DNA comes from many other ancestors. His autosomal DNA, inherited from all branches of his family tree, carries the Mesopotamian component, showing that people from that region had entered his lineage generations earlier, even though his unbroken maternal and paternal lines remained North African. His physical life was equally revealing. 
Isotope analysis, like reading chemical fingerprints in his teeth, painted a clear picture of his childhood. Oxygen isotopes matched the Nile Valley's water sources, and strontium ratios aligned with Egypt's geology, confirming he grew up in the region's hot, dry climate. Carbon and nitrogen isotopes revealed a diet of wheat, barley, animal protein, and possibly Nile fish, or crops, grown in manured fields, typical of early Egyptian farmers. His skeleton showed he stood 157 to 160.5 centimeters tall, about 5 feet 2 inches, and lived to an astonishing 44 to 64 years, likely closer to 64, an age equivalent to reaching your 80s today. Genetic analysis predicted brown eyes and brown to black hair. The facial reconstruction using 3D scans from an Artex space spider scanner brought his weathered features to life, though depicted in black and white due to uncertainties about exact skin and hair shades. His bones told a story of relentless toil. Severe osteoarthritis in his joints and vertebrae, especially the cervical spine, showed decades of physical strain. Muscle marks indicated he held his arms extended, carried heavy loads, and sat on hard surfaces, inflating his pelvic sitting bones. His spine curved from leaning forward, and his right foot bore arthritis from repetitive stress. These clues point to pottery making, likely using the slow-turning pottery wheel introduced to Egypt around 2400 BC, possibly from Mesopotamia or the Levant, via trade routes bypassing the Sinai. Yet, his burial raises a mystery. Pot burials and rock-cut tombs, common in the 3rd and 4th dynasties, were often reserved for higher-status individuals, not humble artisans. The new Eret man's ceramic vessel, sealed and placed in a tomb overlooking the Nile, suggests he held a special place in his community. Was he a master craftsman who created vessels for pyramid workers or the elite? The Old Kingdom's massive projects, like the Pyramids of Giza, relied on skilled artisans who supplied tools, storage jars, and ritual objects. Perhaps he traded with Mesopotamian merchants, gaining wealth and status through his skill. The genome of the new Wayrot man provides key evidence that ancient Egypt was part of a connected world, with people moving and exchanging ideas and goods across regions. Archaeological findings show Egypt traded with the Fertile Crescent from as early as 6000 BC, adopting domesticated plants and animals. By 4000 BC, Mesopotamian influences reached Egypt, but the Nuweirat man's DNA is the first genetic proof of human migration alongside these cultural exchanges, especially during the Neolithic or pre-dynastic periods. The man from Nuweirat is just one piece of a vast and magnificent puzzle, but his story proves that it is now possible to read the genetic history of Egypt. Scientists are hopeful that more genomes can now be recovered, allowing them to map the flow of populations over time and answer enduring questions about this great civilization. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more stories that uncover the secrets of our ancient world. Comment your thoughts below. We'd love to hear your ideas and questions. Until next time, keep seeking the past to better understand the present.